Hello, good evening. Welcome to Middle Stump Live with me, Farouk, the cricket show where you get to post questions to my guest. Thank you to all of you watching via Facebook on the NACC page, the NACC YouTube, Cricket Debate 24-7, and any other platform by which you are tuned into this transmission. Love to have your company. My guests today are enjoying the warmer weather out in Abu Dhabi. I'm delighted to welcome, first of all, former England Essex and now Sussex all-rounder, Ravi Vapara. Ravi, welcome to Middle Stump. <laughs> Ravi, are you there with us? I'm joining Ravi. We've also got Samit Patel, England and Nottinghamshire left on spinners. Samit, welcome. How are you doing, guys? I'm good, thanks. Yes, Ravi, can you hear us there? Like we've got a bit of feedback. I think might be the TV. I'm not getting Ravi there. I mean, I'm not sure what he's watching. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure either, actually. <laughs> I'm not getting Ravi at all. Ravi, are you there with us? Can you hear us? Just about. It keeps cutting in and out, but um, I, if, whenever I can hear you, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll answer. Okay, that's fair. We've seen a bit of background noise. We've got rid of that, whatever that was. Well, thanks, guys, for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to have your company. Obviously, it's a bit warmer where you are. Um, Summit, we'll go with you. How's uh, life treating you out in Dubai? Uh, Abu Dhabi, I beg your pardon, rather. Yeah, uh, pretty staple with the old quarantine for three days and then stuck in the room and got to get through that first before we can get stuck into a bit of cricket. So, um, pretty standard, really. Uh, you'll be used to the quarantine by now because obviously you, you've uh, been out there in Sri Lanka as well. Yeah, no, the the quarantine kind of took the territory, really. So, yeah, it's kind of normal. Um, we get through it by a few Netflix documentaries and, and series, and then that's it, really. Ravi, are you with us? Yeah, I'm with you. Brilliant, mate. We're getting a lot of feedback. I don't know if you're watching the TV as well as watching us, but uh... do you, do you want do you want me to do you want me to turn it down? Yeah, turn the TV down if you're watching the TV, mate. Yeah, surely this is more interesting. <laughs> I don't know. Do you know what? Do you know what? I was I was concentrating on this so much I forgot that the TV was on. <laughs> Me and Summit were trying to work out what you were watching. <laughs> we'll keep talking, Summit, while he's gone. You've not set up any drills in your room or anything like that. It's mean, like the tennis players in Australia have been doing. No, I'm. I kind of get people to feed me the balls. I don't really try and do that. <laughs> Ravi, how are you coping, mate, with the three days uh, locked in your hotel room? Oh. Do you know what? I, I don't enjoy quarantine. It's one of those things that gets to me before I get here because sitting in your room for three days on your own um, with no company, nothing, the way your food gets delivered to the room and everything. So it's, um, I find that a little bit like a little bit depressing. It's quite hard to actually get through three days. Yes, I mean, um, I don't want to sound uh, like, uh, you know, a little bit, you know what I mean, but it is a difficult three days because we're so used to moving around. As, as sportsmen, you're used to just moving around. We don't like sitting in one place for long periods of time. So uh, it can get a little bit difficult for us, boys. I actually don't know how the uh, the boys in Australia that did that big 14 days, that would have that have got me, I reckon. 14 oh, days. 14 days, Australia, yeah. Been, yeah, that would have been killer. You must have some sympathy for the guys like Tom Banton who pulled out playing in the Big Bash because obviously they've been cooped up over the summer with England and, and so on. So it, it can be quite mentally draining. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. Um, I know living in a hotel, it's, it kind of sounds lavish, but to be honest, if you, if you if someone actually did it, then they'd actually know that it's pretty tough. <laughs> yeah, especially if you ain't got any outdoor space. If you've exactly. got no balcony think, or anything, then it, then it gets yeah. even worse because then you are literally confined to your to your yeah. room and the only place you've got to go is your bed and then you might go to the desk if there's a chair there to sit on and you know you just keep moving around do a bit of exercise if you can um that's the only way you really you can keep yourself busy luckily it's only three days and not longer and as i say you're coming out tomorrow and the weather seems quite decent out there so you'll be able to uh make the most of it and get into the pool and obviously get training with, with the rest of the boys Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's good. that's a big part. That will, I'm I'm really looking forward to tomorrow. Um, I think we're going to get government announcements in the morning. So once we've all got those announcements, we can start moving out of our rooms and and go downstairs for breakfast and 
uh, start doing those things. And we got a few few bits and bobs in the morning to do before we go to practice. Um, but then just get that first practice session in, which is uh, which will be good. Is there regular sort of testing going on out there while even during the tournament? Uh, yeah, we, go on, Sam. Go, go on. on. No, no, go. We yeah, we're getting that thing shoved up our nose every every day at the moment. <laughs> uh, really? they, the thing is, they seem to come. They always seem to come when I uh, when I get my dinner. Once I open my dinner, I've got my my plastic knife and fork. I get a knock on the door. I think who could this be now? I open the door. He goes right. You're getting tested. And then just shove that thing right up your nose just before just before dinner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to put you off your food i suppose but it's great to have you with us obviously you're out there for the uh, uh t10 competition now obviously you guys have you know played in many franchises all over the world in the t20 format how different is the t10 compared to the longer version summit uh t10 obviously shorter a bit more crash bang wallet there's no real time for getting yourself in as a batsman i think that you I think getting yourself in will probably be around about three or four balls and then you've got to go, really. I don't think you have time. Um, if you bat later on, like me and Rabbi normally bat in the middle, um, it's generally you've got to try and hit sixes from ball one, um, which is kind of difficult, really. I don't think that no one in the world can come in and hit, or hit a ball straight away for six. I think we all need a bit of time, but especially this format, um, opening batsmen and, and people that bat the top of the order have got more chances to score more runs. Ravi, what game plan do you have when you go out there? Obviously, I mean, something sort of touched upon the idea of hitting sixes. Is there any sort of opportunity to get a sighter, to get a pace of the pitch? Not really. You might get you might get one ball where you can get a sighter, really, or, you know, um, you might get a couple of balls, absolute max. If you're batting in the middle, really, you probably probably got one ball max, and then you've got to start putting it out of the park. Um, so it's a... It's a difficult thing to do, especially when you haven't got your eye in, you're right, and, and we're not getting the pace of the pitch. Uh, it's a difficult thing to do as a batsman. But then you switch it around to the bowling side. Then as a bowler, you feel under pressure as well. You always feel like, you know what, if I put it in the wrong place, um, I could really e easily get hit for a boundary. And, you know, the aim of the game is not to go for boundaries. And when you're batting, the aim of the game is to hit as many boundaries as you can. The team that hits the most boundaries is going to win. Sammy, you're a bit, obviously, uh, Ravi sort of touched on it on my next question. As a bowler in this format, you're on a hard into nothing, but what game plans do you tend to go in with? Um, it depends if you're bowling in the power play or out the power play. It doesn't really differ too much, but um, I think generally the fuller you bowl, especially on wickets that keep a little bit low, the, especially as I'm a spinner and, and I'm sure it kind of, I try and get under the bat um, and try and take out the arc of, of a batsman to hit. And then variations of bowling a wider a, a, a wide slow one um or a wide yorker um your yorkers are probably the way forward for me in in this format of the, of the game um as ravi touched on there keeping the runs runs down and not go for boundaries i think that if you go at 10 normally i, I played in the in the last three i think if you go at 10 you've done a really good job um two overs of 20 i think um it's, it's pretty good and Ravi, your medium paces, do they have much uh, worth in this format? Well, they, they worked in the first T10 um, uh, when we played at Sharjah. Um, you know, I felt like I bowled really well then. Uh, I didn't play in it after that because I was busy with other competitions, but um, I got the opportunity to come back. Um, what I found here is what Samit said. I think it's important to get underneath the bat, uh, you know, that really, really full length where the batters can't get underneath the ball. Um, that really, really works. But that definitely works at Sharjah because uh, Sharjah is such a small ground. Is If you do miss your length, it's, it's a miss hit for six, whereas the, the ground in Abu Dhabi is probably going to be a little bit bigger. I'm not sure what size the boundaries are going to be. I think we're going to find out when we go to the stadium tomorrow. We'll get an idea. Uh, so your tactics can change according to the boundary sizes as well. If you've got a really big leg side boundary, then really you want the batter to, to hit you out to that side. Or if it's a really small leg side boundary then obviously you got to keep the batter away from from that boundary so your tactics can change just to the to the dynamics of the ground uh, i think last year i think the wind uh, the wind factor last year was, was quite big actually because i don't know if, really, if you know that it gets quite windy it's quite an open ground we've played there before but i think that we've, we've got to really take that into consideration when especially when you're bowling really. you're both heading off to the PSL, off, 
obviously after this. Um, so, uh, Ravi, you played for Karachi Kings for quite a few seasons and now obviously are at the uh, Multan Sultans. How have you found it at, with the new franchise? Well, it was good. I mean, I played for Multan Sultans um, last year. It was a really, really good outfit and, and a really well run team. Andy Flower was the coach there. We, we actually did really well in the competition. We finished top of the league um, going into the semis and all that sort of stuff. And then obviously coronavirus and and all that sort of stuff. So we had to stop the competition there and come back sort of six to eight months later and finish it off. Um, we had really, really good um, uh, momentum at that time. And it just when we came that when we came back to finish off the tournament, we sort of lost our momentum a little bit um, and we and we crashed out in the semi-finals, unfortunately. But uh, that was a good experience. I'm actually playing for Zelmi uh, this year. Okay, so you're... Uh... Collecting even more uh, franchise shirts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's plenty of franchise shirts in my house. Helmets, uh, all that sort of... I've just gone down to just keeping one shirt now. Everywhere I go, I just keep one for myself and usually just leave the rest in the room and, and all that sort of stuff. So, But um, then once I once I get back to England, all my all, that's when all my friends ask me, have you got a shirt then? Have you got a shirt? I said, well, I left one you asked me before. I left them all. Yeah. Well, I did have a, a question for you later on in the show, Ravi, to try and name as many of the different franchises that you've played for. So I'll give you a little bit of thinking time and maybe you can uh, you know, get your idea together and I'll tick them off my list. Uh, hopefully there'll be some on my list. Not that I haven't got on my list that you know of. Uh, Summit, you obviously uh, spent some time with Islamabad and have since moved to Lahore. And I was reading the other day your coach, Akib Javid, and I quote him, he was thrilled to sign Rashid Khan but he went on to say that Samit Patel's pick gave me the most satisfaction. Our team combination has been around Samit. Does that put any extra pressure on you to deliver? No, not really. Not not with the likes of Rashid Khan in the team. I don't think there's any sort of pressure, to be honest. Um, but obviously, yeah, that's really pleasing to, to know that a coach really backs you, um, firstly. Um, but yeah, no, things at Lahore have been great um, ever since that. I've, went there last year from Islamabad, um, who, again, were a great franchise. But I think Lahore, it, it's more more the fact that they'd not performed to where they wanted um, and the fact that they contribute to a winning team um, gave me a lot more satisfaction, to be honest. I know we won it with Islamabad, but to contribute and get to a, to take Lahore to, to finals, which they'd never done before. So I think that was really crucial from my point of view. And we had some good players in our team and our bowling attack was... I think we had some good pace, and obviously our, our our spinners did a good job now now and then. So yeah, it was it was kind of good, and then we managed to beat Ravi's lot in that in that semi final. Um, so we kind of got a lot of momentum going in, and coronavirus didn't help, but we we managed to come back um, and and put in a, a really good show, and unfortunately lost to Karachi. You touched upon Islamabad there, obviously. Uh, you played under the late Dean Jones. I mean, you know, we hear a lot about him. But for you, how charismatic and effective a coach and a man manager actually was he during your time at Islamabad? Yeah, I know. Dean was um, really good. He was the first player to introduce me to franchise cricket. Um, he actually signed me from Hong Kong, the Hong Kong Blitz, where I played for um, Kowloon Cantons. And then from then on, he was he was kind of in my ear saying that we're going to sign you. And, and before I knew it, I'd signed for him for two years and... Yeah, the rest is pretty history. And then, yeah, the, the amount of, again, a coach where he doesn't really coach um, the whole mindset kind of aspects where he, he, he trying to make you a lot better in the power hitting side. Um, no one really gave him the credit for that. Uh, but secretly, I know that players have been in that Islamabad team that have, have definitely gone on to represent countries. You've obviously both played under a lot of different coaches. And obviously, um, you know, you picked up bits from every coach. But if I was to say to you, if you could have one coach in your corner at every game you're at, who would that coach be? Ravi, over to you first, my friend. Oof, that's a tough one. Um, that, that is a real tough one. That is such a tough one because because every coach has his um, has his bit that you love, and um, there's so many coaches I've got on with. I, I think they've all been brilliant. It's so hard to put a name on one. Honestly, it's 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 one of the hardest things to do because. I think with coaching, the most important thing is how do you get on with the person that you're, you know, your player and your coach, what's your, what's your relationship like? Um, it's not so much how, what sort of technique can he, you know, how can he make you better technically and all that sort of stuff. I mean, that helps, but 
it's it's how you it's how you're with each other, um, which makes you want to play for that coach. It you feel backed um, and all that sort of stuff. So it's so so hard to put a to to, to put a name on it. It's it's too difficult because there's coaches I've played for under you know uh, in county cricket that I played for under uh, ten years or or something like that. I mean, has somebody and then I've played for a coach where I've only represent he's. Um, We've only played for a month together, and it's been unbelievable as well. So, it's so that's what makes it so difficult. Sammy, any any thoughts on that from your point of view? No, no got to sit on the fence with Ravi. Um, oh. <laughs> definitely can't put a name on any coach. Um, if you gave us two, I'd give you two, but I can't give you one. Well, go on, give us your, give me two then. It's better than one or none. No, I'd have to put I'd have to put Flower and Moores together. Um, if they were combined, they'd be the best coaches in the world, I reckon. Okay, that's fair enough. I'll let the rubby sit on the fence and we'll come back to him maybe. At the well, end of the uh, you know, there's been some good ones. Gary Kirsten's very good. I think Gary Kirsten was brilliant, a hard worker. Uh, Tom Moody's always been good. I've got on well with him, really, really well. Then I've had my county coaches that I played under for years. All of them I've, I've really enjoyed playing under. Andy Flower. Oh, yeah, just I can just keep reading them off. They're all brilliant. How much is it? How much of it, though, is the buy-in from the player and feeling comfortable and confident with the message and the approach that the coach is trying to get across, uh, rather than the, the, the actual coach himself? I actually don't think it should be all on the player. I don't think it should be on the coach. I know going when we were really young that it, it's all about a coach, and actually now I think the best coaches will just let you be and ask you what you need. And obviously, make you feel as confident as you can before a game. And I think they are the best coaches. You both toured uh, Pakistan about 12 months ago. I know it seems a long, long time ago with the uh, MCC, along with Ajmal and various others. How significant a tour do you think that that was in terms of the return of uh, international cricket and obviously South Africa out there at the moment to Pakistan and the future tours that are obviously you know in the pipeline? Ravi, yeah, I think it makes a big statement for MCC to go out there um, because you know a place like Pakistan, a place like Pakistan really needs cricket to come back from, especially from England. You know, that it has such a big following of cricket in England, and and Pakistan have always enjoyed having England over as well. So it, I think that sends a massive statement. All the players that came over, Sangakara was there as well. Um, it was such a, it, it was such a fun little tour. Uh, I remember, Sam. It was it was good fun, wasn't it? We quite, yeah. quite enjoyed it. It was. Yeah, it was, it was actually it was... really it was really relaxed. Um, the cricket was obviously a good standard, um, and it actually prepared blokes that were playing in the PSL to play on pitches that we were trying to get used to. Um, and I think it helped me a lot. I can speak for Abby as well. That obviously it was great for great for Pakistan cricket um, and getting cricket back in Pakistan. But personally, it was brilliant for the guys playing in the PSL. From the clips that I've seen of it, obviously, you were almost like treated like royalty while you were out there. I think that happens in in subcontinent anyway. <laughs> Anywhere you go in the subcontinent, you get treated like royalty when you're a cricketer. So um, that was a that was almost something you just you know is going to happen. And um, but those those places are great hosts to cricketers, and, and that's why cricket's massive out here. I mean, everybody loves to come and play in the subcontinent. It's a great place to play your cricket. Some of the best venues in the world. Obviously, you know, Pakistan and India don't play any bilateral series at the moment, and both of you being of Indian heritage. How did you find the reception towards you? Were they even more warm towards you that two players of Indian heritage have actually made that effort to come and play in Pakistan, even though the national side from India obviously won't engage in cricketing ties with Pakistan? Absolutely. Um, I, I think that you kind of feel welcomed the moment you step into Pakistan, to be honest. Um, I, I can't really fault it. I don't know what Ravi thinks, but... I yeah, they've been brilliant. The we, yeah, the way we get looked at here, um, can't, it's, it's been brilliant. It's been really good. The, fa the fans, the following of cricket have been so good to us. And I mean, I've never felt that um, that divide, you know, where you know, we're of Indian heritage, some of Indian heritage, I, I'm of that, but I've never felt like that in Pakistan. Um, I've always, they've always made me feel welcome and made me feel one of, uh, like one of their own. So, uh, and and you know, look, look, let's be, let's be real. At the end of the day, India, Pakistan, same thing. 
you know that, that it was once one one big country so um for someone like me and sammy it just doesn't make a difference we, we you know but the way we were treated by the a by the fans the hotel staff uh players everybody around us have, have been fantastic and uh i'd want i'd like to thank them all for that Thank you very much. Hopefully anyone's watching out there, they'll, uh, I'm sure we'll welcome you with open arms again when you return very, very soon. Uh, Ravi, sticking with the franchise cricket, we've got the delayed 100 starting this summer. Is it something that the domestic cricket in this country needed? And what do you think it's going to bring extra to the table? Um, now, the question, you, uh, it, was it needed uh, is, is a big question. I mean, I think, it's, I think it's great to have it. I think it's brilliant to have it and it will... Uh, it will make a difference to to our cricket in England, uh, but the T20 blast was always running well anyway. That was one of the, you know, an incredibly successful competition. Um, but I think it's still a good idea. I think it's a it's a brilliant um, it's a brilliant way to bring new people into the into the game because it's going to be on mainstream TV. You know, it's going to be some live games games on there. It's only ninety minutes as well, so it's it's going to be in and out sort of thing. So. Um, I think it's a brilliant idea um, and I think it will improve English cricket because there's going to be some strong sides out there. I mean, you look down the list uh, of players in each squad, there's it's, it's just some serious, serious squads out there. Some of the, I think it's going to be some of the strongest teams going around the world. Just playing devil's advocate here, still sticking with you, Ravi. Would it, I know you've mentioned the Vitality Blast, a very, very successful uh, package. Would it not have been easier to simply increase the number of overseas players uh, within the Vitality Blast, so maybe to three to four, and just stick with that? Mm, no, because then some youngster or, you know, somebody else has to miss out that's, that's homegrown. So, um, and that's, that becomes a problem because you miss out on talent. You never know who, you know, you could leave anyone out. But you don't know how that player is going to grow during the T20 Blast or the next few years. Uh, so I say it's important that English players play domestic cricket. And as many English players as possible are playing it. Uh, and I think that's I think I think the T20 is absolutely fine the way it runs. You know, two overseas players is enough. There's enough cr cricketers and good cricketers in England uh, to keep that competition strong. Summit, you one of the few players who actually has uh, played a little bit of the hundred because you captained the North against the South in the trial match. What did you make of your first sort of experience of it? Uh, there wasn't too much difference to be honest. Um, I treated it just like a T20 game, but the rules slightly differ. Obviously, it's lesser balls, but the whole mindset of batting and bowling is, is pretty much the same. But I think that the things that captains will probably get caught on is that the whole ball factor of, um, obviously, the maximum balls your ball is 20. Um, and bowl 10 in a row, but not obviously a, the first over. You can only bowl five balls. Um, so that's the only kind of difference um, that I noticed, I think that we, our whole mindset of T20 cricket is as, as the 100 ball, really. Uh, Ravi's right. The standard of cricket in England is of, of, of the highest quality, I think, that is, especially if we get uh, 100 teams involved now, uh, the squads that you look out there. But there is definitely talent in England. Uh, we've just got to utilise it properly. Ravi, you didn't put up a reserve price for yourself, but you got snapped by Birmingham. A calculated move on your part? I thought reserve. I do. Uh, yeah, Sam, it did. But um, no, I, I didn't. I didn't. Don't worry. I've not forgotten you. Uh, get Ravi out there. Yeah. No, I, I didn't. I didn't feel like I needed a. I needed a reserve price. I was happy to, you know, whatever happens and whatever contract I get or wherever I get picked. I, I, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a big deal for me because I just wanted to play in the competition. Um, you know, luckily I got picked up in one of the first couple of rounds, and it was uh, it was nice. Um, but no, nah, I didn't put. Uh, you know, that, I think I think that would have been a silly move, to be honest, Samit. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Looking back, but as it worked out in hindsight, I don't know. I mean, obviously, Samit, you did put up a reserve price, and obviously, you you sadly for your case didn't get uh, accepted. So you're still hopeful of uh, you know getting snapped up in this year's draft. Yeah, hopefully. Um, obviously, I'll be removing the uh, the. The reserve price. Um, to be honest, to be honest, hope, it was it was ridiculous that Sammy didn't get picked up. Let's be let's be honest, because a player of his caliber, you know, he's the the his record in T20 cricket, the amount of cricket he's played, his experience, and 
what he brings to the team. I thought it was ridiculous that you didn't get picked. In, you know, I, I still, I'm still shocked now that you didn't get picked up. Well, it's kind of my fault. I thought it was fair on it. Maybe teams thought that he's quite a reserve. I mean, we're not taking him. I, I don't. Know. I, re- I, I, I remember. I remember us having a chat before, um, and talking about the reserve price. And I said to him, uh, "We'll message each other." And uh, I said to him, are you, "Are you silly putting a reserve price on?" And he's like, "No, no, no. I'm going to put a reserve price." I said, "Mate, you're silly." I said, just, just leave it open. You'll get picked up in one of the first few rounds anyway, so don't worry about it. And, um, you know, in hindsight, yeah. it was okay in because h- the competition didn't go ahead and now you've yeah, got another it chance. Did, it didn't go ahead. And I think there's there's some slots there now that hopefully I do still get picked up. Um, and you, yeah, You'll I'm get picked up. Looking, well, who knows? Like we, You will get picked up. <laughs> but everyone thought I would have got picked up last year. I didn't. But I'm yeah, sure you. Will. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you will. And uh, fingers crossed for you, um, Robbie. I just want to go uh, on to you next, please. Um, you ended your association with Essex. You joined the county age of seventeen, and seventeen years later, you decided to part company with them. How difficult a decision was it, and what did it eventually come down to? Oh, it was such a tough decision. You know, I I never wanted to leave Essex. Um, never, ever, ever in my whole entire career. I thought about leaving Essex, even up until probably the last um, probably the last couple of weeks, I think, because the the big thing that happened during the season was um, I was obviously in my last year of of, of my contract, and um, uh, I had been signing uh, one year contracts for the last couple of years. Um, although I was asking for for more, I was asking for longer terms and uh, but I wasn't getting them and um, that was a little bit frustrating um, and also on top of that in the T20 blast I think after the first couple of games I got dropped by the by the new new captain we had a new captain and uh, he dropped me from the side um, with no I felt like no real reason uh, no valid reason to drop me given my history of performances with with Essex in, in that format, um, but he felt it was it was the right thing to do. Um, we how has he dropped you? How how has he dropped you? <laughs> well, that question has never been answered. Um, that question has never been answered. I, you know, I I tried to get my answer at the time, and it was never answered. And two games later, we didn't play very well. Uh, two games later, or three games later, he got me back in. Um, because I went, I went and played second team cricket. So I said, "Look, I'll go and play second team cricket and and, pr- and prove you wrong." Um, and I think I went and went away and scored two hundreds in the second team uh, in the T Twenty games, and got uh, I was getting wickets and and everything. And so there was really no option but to get me back in because if you're performing in second team cricket, the whole point is to get you up into the first team. Um, so he had to get me back in, and that from that point onwards, we never looked back. We won every game from that point onwards, um, and I probably had some of our best performances uh, from from there. I think I got ended up getting something like five or six man of the matches in a row, um, and it just kept going, and we kept going, we kept winning, and then ultimately ended up winning the competition. But going back to the original reason why I, um, I didn't end up staying is because. I had asked for a longer contract. It wasn't, it wasn't given to me, and then um, I wasn't wasn't quite sure why it wasn't given to me. So I said, okay, I'm, look, I'll, I'll I'll just play T20 cricket. Uh, if it makes it easier, um, you can reduce my contract and my payments and everything. Uh, but that wasn't offered to me either. They said no, um, and then uh, they came up with a with an offer that just didn't suit me it was a it was a one-year offer again and uh, I made it clear that one year is it's just not going to cut it and um I want to sign a longer term I want to spend the rest of my career here um and they then they said well all offers are off the table which meant then obviously at the end of the season I think we were in September by then um I didn't have anywhere else to go to um and then I had to look for a replacement I did go back to Essex and say look this is a situation I really want to sign longer term and it wasn't it wasn't happening, and then, you know, uh, I didn't really have a choice, really, in the end. You described it as being chucked out of your house. Um, is it really, really 
something that got to you and, and it took you quite some time to get over, Ravi? Yeah, it took me a long time to get. I don't think I'm still quite over it. Um, yeah, and it, it did feel like that. It felt like being chucked out of your own house, yeah. Um, it, just, it just didn't sit right with me. I've, n I've never quite got my head around it. Um, there were days I was in tears. Um, I very rarely go into tears for, about anything, and but that put me that set me back big time, and and um, started doubting myself and on all sorts, and and uh, it was a it's been a horrible what is it been eighteen months uh, needy, you know since it happened or whatever it's been. Um, I've never I've, I've never till this day got over it, so it's one of those things that's just going to live with me for the rest of my life. I think. Yeah, I appreciate your uh, forthrightness and uh, honesty there, Ravi, because uh, it's not something that's easy to talk about, and particularly when you're on live on, on social media here. So uh, thank you very much for sort of bearing your soul to everyone here. Uh, Sammy, I just want to go back now and rewind the clock for both of you, and I just want to look at how you both got into cricket. And in your case, Sammy, and then obviously we'll follow on with Ravi, was it a case of a family member maybe playing and you're going along to watch and then getting the bug for the game, or was there another route that you uh, took into cricket? No, actually, um, it was my dad that was playing cricket, um, just a local league cricket. Um, I used to follow about and play cricket, always used to have a bat and ball. Um, and it's kind of in the blood as an Indian that they used to watch cricket and play cricket. Um, and one of my biggest rivals has been Sachin. I know Ravi's a big Sachin fan. Um, it's it's something that I used to watch and I still remember the, the game I used to bat at Sharjah and I always speak about it and... You won't, you can't forget those the memories that you used to watch, watch him bat and the excitement you got, and that kind of just drove me to, to play cricket really. Um, and obviously, everything else comes along with it. You have to work hard, um, and the sacrifices you have to make, and obviously, not just me, but my parents have to make that. And go looking forward, looking looking like what they used to do is that drive you up and down the M1, county matches, um, not go to work. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to it. Um, so yeah, I'm very thankful of that, and yeah, we've had Ajmal on, and we obviously we spoke to him about the role of the parents and the support network around him. Ravi, uh, would you sort of have a similar experience whereby family, parents, uncles, even grandparents were there ferrying you from ground to ground, training session, all hours of the day, night, etc.? Yeah. yeah, yeah, my story is very really similar to Samit's. Um, my dad was playing sort of uh, just sort of league cricket. I used to follow him about as well and take, you know, bat and ball. Me and my brother used to just play uh, on the side while my while my dad was playing. And that's where I got the bug for the game. And and obviously my hero, um, Sachin Tendulkar as well. And that, yeah, my granddad even drove me to games. I remember him driving me all the way up to Yorkshire for a game. So, um, you know, he was there. Well, that's when he could drive. I won't trust him now. But um, <laughs> that's, when he, that's when he could take me around at that time. But uh, it was a, a big support. From from my family, my my mum and my dad, uh, my granddad was a big part of it as well, and I think they played a massive role. And to be fair, we wouldn't have done it without them. We've got everything, everything that's happened is you know we owe it to them really because there's so many kids out there, so many talented kids, especially in the Asian background who who never never quite come through. You know, you always wonder how did he not make it or how did he not come through. And I think a big you know a big a case of that is is uh, probably not enough uh, support, um, you know, getting them here and there because that's a big part of it. Getting getting kids to go here and there, and 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 the parents making time to take them kids is a big part of it. Uh, so so I've got a lot of uh, thanks to give to my parents. Good stuff, uh, Sammy. Um, obviously, cricket was something that you want to pursue. But was there ever any pressure from the family to sort of go down a more traditional, secure career path? Because obviously sport can be quite risky. And then being of Asian heritage, we always want our sons and daughters maybe to be doctors or accountants or bankers and have a safe, steady career that the aunties and the uncles in the community will say, wow, fantastic, look at him, look at him. And that community pressure plays a big part. Did you ever experience any of that? To be honest, no. Um, I was very forward and saying that basically I didn't want to pursue any kind of academics over 18, after 18. Um, I was lucky enough to go to private school at Worksop College where the likes of Joe Root have been. Um, so in, in that kind of sense, I wasn't pressured. Um, my dad knew that exactly what I wanted to do and I told him that 
I'd do everything to try and be a pro cricketer. And thankfully, 20 years down the line where I'm still playing professional cricket. So, yeah, there was no kind of pressure. I know that the stereotypical role is to go and be a banker or a doctor or a nurse. Um, but no, from my perspective, there was there was no pressure. I mean, Robbie, neither of you obviously went on to university, so you obviously gave up that option. Uh, so it did probably put a lot of pressure on you to make it work in the cricketing environment because basically you put all your eggs into one basket effectively. Yeah, yeah. Um, but listen, uh, I'm not sitting there saying I would have made it to uni, to be honest. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, um, I, I, I didn't go to uh, I didn't go to private school. So I went to, uh, uh, you know, a government school where uh, there was no cricket played in our school. Um, we, we did have a, like a, a, a sort of a grimy sort of astroturf pitch in the middle of the field which was never used and never looked after so that was never an option of playing cricket in school was was just not one of those things I was lucky though that the community I lived around all the the kids they they loved playing cricket and football in the in the in the local playground and that's where we used to go and play so I learned a lot of my stuff on on, on a play in a playground where we used to climb over the gates and uh, uh, all get together and, and just play a big match um, so it was, a, it was it was a massive Asian community where I lived. So that was a I think that was a big thing for me uh, coming through in cricket. I don't think if if I didn't have that community to play because they're all older than me as well. They're all like five years older than me. If I didn't have that, then it may have been a struggle because um, there was no cricket in my school. So you know it's it, you spend a lot of time at school, and so. It would have been a tough one, really. And obviously, the club the club that I played for played a massive role. The, the people that I played with, they were great people and pushed me and uh, backed me as well. So I was lucky in that way. Sammy, you obviously got uh, selected for England under 15s and went, went on to 17s and 19s. Uh, how did the community react to your initial success, you know, as a 15 year old putting on that three lion shirt? Uh, what was the uh, reaction from family and the wider community that you sort of lived within? Yeah, no, the reaction was really good. Um, obviously, you get pigeonholed as, as an up-and-coming player. Um, and obviously, representing England at 15 is quite a big thing back then. Um, and obviously, going through all the age groups, um, you still get tipped of, of playing for England under 19s at a very young age. And I was thankful and young, young enough to play at 16 at 19. So... Yeah, no, I was um, pretty thrilled and the community were as well, but I knew that I still had to keep my feet on the ground because there was a lot more hard work to do um, going forward and I was just trying to make a, a career out of, of playing cricket. It's easy to get carried, of... yeah, sorry, it's easy to get carried away, Sammy, at that early age and, you know, you're dreaming way above where you actually are. How did you manage to keep yourself focused and your feet firmly on the ground? Was it your family or was it just that you were very yeah. driven? Yeah, no, it was family who basically kept me grounded um, to a level where I didn't get above of where I went needed to be at a given time. Um, and I think that my dad played a big role in that. Um, so going moving forward to play professional cricket, I think there was always standards that you needed to be at to be a professional cricketer. And I think that, one, you have always have to believe in yourself and... Two, I just love playing cricket, and I definitely can speak on to Ravi on that part, that loving the game of cricket even now to this day um, is where is why I still play the game. I think that the day I don't enjoy it, I will, I don't think I'll be playing. What advice would you give, Summit, to any youngsters who are sort of, you know, 15, 16-year-olds now looking to, you know, following your footsteps as a wise, older Summit Patel? What would you sort of suggest to them to be mindful of? Um, some of those steps really keeping your feet grounded um, if you have I think talent will get you to a certain level and I think you'll need hard work and a bit of maturity to go a long way to, to find because there'll be periods in your life where that you'll need to accept that people people catch up and I think that as cricketers you'll always you always need to improve and you, you'll always be harsh on yourself um, and have a critic to, to keep you in check, to be honest. Um, and to move forward in that aspect is never never stop believing because if you don't believe in yourself, I don't think no one else will. 
So that's that's one advice I'd definitely give. Lovey, you wore the three lines at under 19. Uh, how pivotal a moment was that in your cricketing journey? Yeah, it was good. I mean, I think representing South of England when I was a bit younger was a was a big step. I, I think once I think the day where I went on a South of England trip to play was the day I started thinking, right, I'm going to go on and play for England. Um, this is this is my destiny. This is what I'm going to do. Um, my goal now is to go on and play for England and and not worry about anything else now. Um, so. From an early age, I think my my goal was to go and play international cricket, and and I set my stall out quite early. And um, I think, as well as keeping your feet on the ground, you still got to think big. You got you got to think big, and you got to go. You know, I, I want to go all the way. I want to play international cricket. I want to there's there, you know I want to I want to do this on the international stage, and you know I want to score hundred on the international stage. You got to think big, and. Um, fortunately for me, I was already thinking like that. I think from from the day South of England uh, wrote me a letter to say to, to represent them, that was I think that was the step that I thought, yeah, I, I'm good enough to now go on and 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 do it. And I had a really good trip with South of England. I did really well, and I realised that um, I, I was as good as the other players around the country. And I think that gives you a lot of belief as well because. You know, when you're young, the country seems so big. You think, you know, imagine all those players out there, all over the place. There's players in Yorkshire. There's, you know, in the Midlands. They're everywhere, uh, and you think they're surely they're all them are all better than me. But when you get there and you you perform and you do well, and you think actually, this is what this is what I'm meant to do. This is this is my stage, and I'm going to go on and do it. Summit in 2003, you were uh, handed the captaincy of the under 19s in the World Cup only for it to be stripped from you. Firstly, how did you react to that mentally? You know, the great honour of Captain England in the under-19s, and then, I'm sorry, you're not captain. Uh, funny enough, actually, Ravi was... Uh, we were doing a... We had a camp at Loughborough, actually, and Ravi was my yeah. roommate. Um, <laughs> and we kind of, as Asians, do, don't really apply to... Don't really do discipline, to be honest. And <laughs> we kind of missed breakfast a few times, and then... We, didn't abide by the eating rules and then um we kind of didn't pass a fitness test and then suddenly next thing i got killed called in, in the morning saying that we're going to strip your cookie the captain of uh of the world cup team going to bangladesh so okay. yeah i didn't react too well yeah. to that yeah yeah do you think it was a fair call or was it an overreaction i think it was an overreaction in my personal view but that's the rest of the history i was going to get now Absolutely, but then there's since I followed a bit of a similar pattern, and obviously the 2000 you know West Indies tour, you know the 2019 20 World Cup, the 2011 World Cup, and whereby obviously your fitness kept getting called into question. What exactly was it? What was it? Just a case of Samit Patel being a soft target and let's nail him for everything, or what? What was it about you, Samit, that the, the, the people doing the testing didn't like? Well, if I didn't really. I wasn't. I, I, if looking back, I don't think I was fit enough. But I think fitness is a little bit different. Um, it's fitness for cricket, and then there's fitness. That if someone would have told me to bowl 30 years and I could do it, and if someone told me I could bat all day, I'd definitely bat all day. But passing a fitness test to me, um, I, I couldn't do at that stage, and that's why they didn't pick me. Drop me. Um, and again, that was one of the toughest years of my life, um, knowing the fact that I was good enough to play for England and they're not playing me kind of hurt me a lot more. Um, How did you deal with it? How did you deal with that mentally? Because it must have been quite demoralising. Yeah, absolutely. Reading the press uh, when I got home, um, reacting to family, all that kind of, all that kind of stuff that goes in the territory. Um, I can't, don't really want to wish upon anybody, to be honest. Um, reading the fact that everyone else has read it and then you're getting a tag from it um, was, was difficult. And uh, I just, I got through it by family, um, close family and, and myself really driving myself, um, knowing the fact that I was pretty stubborn, knowing the fact that I was, I was doing it my way and I wanted to do it my way. Um, and playing cricket to prove people wrong um, was another way of going about it. And knowing the fact that, cricket would do the talking and nothing else would 
and that's what we do. We play cricket. I mean, hindsight. So, Hindsight is a wonderful thing, Sam. It, but uh, do you feel that that sort of took away some of the best years and, and so many more opportunities for international cricket that you could have been blessed with? Maybe. Um, and that's both parties' fault, in my opinion. Um, mainly my fault. Um, but again, but this, someone would have there, there, was, there was times that I think Sam it was a little bit harshly treated. Um, sorry to butt in, but I, I, I genuinely genuinely think there was times where he was partially treated. He should have played more for England. Uh, and that whole fitness thing, I mean, it got a bit silly in the end. I think it was just an easy, it was an easy option uh, for for some of the, the people who were selecting at the time. And I can say it now, I'm not playing for England. And so, you know, I can I can say what I like really, but um, I think it's, uh, it, they got a bit carried away with it. I think he should have played more and, and he definitely had the ability to play more and, uh, they, he was better than some of the players that were playing at the time. Um, listen, I've, I've seen I've seen people who are not that fit playing for England and had long careers for England. Um, I've been there. I, you know, I was in that. I was in the setup for you know almost ten years. So I've seen people come through who are not very fit. Um, it's just because they don't look. They, they, it's just because they don't look unfit. Uh, you know, they got a shirt on, and um, you know, it's, it's just because they don't look unfit. I think that was a big thing. I think it was more aesthetics. I think it was the, the way it looks um, that everybody got a bit carried away with. Um, I think Sammy, Sammy's been honest enough to say a little bit was, you know, it was it was both. It was uh, at fault from both sides, you know. And he, if he, if if he, if he had gone away and gone right, if that's the reason they're keeping me out. I will do whatever I can uh, to to make myself look fitter. And and you know, if if I look fitter to the eye, then it'll be a lot easier for them. Uh, and not really give them a reason. So, um, but in my opinion, I think he was harshly treated at times. It looks like you got a friend there for life, uh, Summit. He'll back you to the hills. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, no. I, as I said, it's both parties' fault. But I, I definitely honour what Ravi just said there about different having different rules for different people, and I that didn't quite sit well with me at the time, and I didn't obviously didn't say anything. But yeah, people get looked after a little bit differently um and maybe i wasn't easy to to get dropped did you feel that maybe again without you know going into any great depth about it that maybe your uh, ethnicity and your color might have contributed towards being treated that way at all no i no there's no i i can't put it solely on that to be honest um the fact that i don't think english it was in a great position itself um, at the time, and I think that they, they were looking for a change. And the easiest way to have a change is is to pinpoint a few areas where they need to get better. Um, so, yeah, that was it really. But I can't you know, the whole um, ethnicity thing. I, I can't really. That doesn't sit well with me. I mean, uh, there's. I mean, I read somewhere that uh, on one occasion you went over to the Gold Coast and you had a personal trainer and you got dropped off uh, about eight kilometres outside Brisbane in the scorching heat and you had to basically run back to uh, your hotel or wherever you were stopping. Is there any truth in that? There, that's absolutely true. I went to the Gold Coast um, <laughs> and we drove out around 20 k's and then we had to get back. And, and it wasn't only just running. It was like walking jogging it was literally it was a whole mindset thing of you can actually do it rather than you've got to do it um which wasn't it wasn't too bad 20 k's out you just had to get home and, then, and that was it really um but that kind of improved my attitude towards the whole fitness thing to be honest um i still remember that andy flower basically rang me saying that you've got to go to brisbane for a month um and if you don't then you won't play for england again and like he didn't really give me any sort of option. He just said that that's it. So, but the one thing I will say about Andy is that he was caring. Like he wanted, he wanted me to be the best I could be, and would still want me to play for England. And I, I don't think I had that had that from past coaches. Um, even though Andy wouldn't pick me, but they would, he would say that this is what you need to to, to get picked. And eventually, he picked me anyway. And then in two fifteen. Trevor picked me to go on a Pakistan trip to Dubai for a test series and then managed to get onto a South Africa test trip. Um, and yeah, the fitness issue then was gone by then. But if, for me, it, it felt like I still had a tag, which was kind of disappointing because I didn't quite have the final say to play cricket or test cricket. And then no one 
I didn't get anything, and no feedback after 2015. Um, just one last uh, point on that. I've got an interesting quote of you, uh, from Mike Newell here. He's, and he, and he quote says that uh, you, your wedding led to the further slipping of standards during his honeymoon. Where did you go, Sammy? To a chocolate factory or what? I mean, uh, <laughs> what happened? To my honeymoon? I'm not yeah, quite sure what you meant by that. Yeah, obviously, whilst you're on your honeymoon, you must have obviously piled on a few pounds, I, I, all I can assume from his comments there. Well, that's... Well, I'm not quite sure where he's got that one from. I'll have to have a chat with Nick, actually. Yeah. yeah. Have a chat. Give, <laughs> give, me, give me a ring after this. Give me a ring after this yeah, chat. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> you're just yeah. Um, uh, so, obviously, uh, anyway, well, good, well, Ravi, you uh, made your test debut in 2007. It didn't quite go according to plan. In 2007, yeah. I mean, that was in Sri Lanka. Um, yeah. Um, obviously, so excited to make my test debut. A little bit nervous at the time, but, you know, I was, I was, I was a kid then. I think I was 21 or whatever I was. Uh, up against the likes of Sangakara, Mahela, uh, Murlithran, Jasuria. Them boys were playing at that time, and um, I was excited about it. And, and no, it didn't go to plan, actually. It was um, a tough tour. My first innings was okay. I was really happy, you know, first going in, playing against Murali. Um, and I think I got 30-odd in the first innings. And, and then um, after that, I got caught down leg side off Murali in the second dig. Um, in the, uh, and then went to the next test match. And I think we only got one innings at that time. And the wicket was so flat. It was a Beautiful wicket. I think we were we'd scored loads of runs. I was coming in at number six, um, and I think it was the third new ball when I was coming in. Someone had just, I think Collingwood had just got out, that is and I'd walked in, <laughs> and uh, and Malinga was bowling, and it's the first time I'd ever faced Malinga, and he bowled me an out swinging Yorker first ball, which I went to hit through the leg side, and it hit my off stump. At the ground, first ball on on the flattest wicket in the world. Uh, so obviously I missed out there, got a zero there. Uh, didn't get another innings because it was, but it was the wicket was too flat. It was a draw. Then we went to Gorn, and on the morning of the match, after the toss, just after the toss, we were doing some slip catching practice, and um, I went to catch on in the slips and I bust my thumb. We weren't allowed to change our team, so you know we weren't. Once you've made, once you've tossed the coin and your teams are announced, you can't you can't change them after that. So I bust my thumb about twenty minutes before play. So and we we batted first, I think, or whatever it was. I can't remember now. And I just remember the whole the whole thing, man. He the, he's, he's I was next in, and they said, right, keep your hand on the table. Keep you know my hand had to be on the table. They said, as soon as the wicket falls, we're going to inject your thumb, uh, and your hand will go numb, so you won't feel the pain. Blah, blah blah. So I just remember, I mean, them just tanking me up on painkillers and then put the needle in just before I went in. Went in. Honestly, I couldn't feel my hand. So I think it was Chiminda Vars bowling. Um and I went to drive one through the covers. I went to drive one through the covers and I looked through the covers. Where's the ball gone? And then I looked around and I heard heard them saying, catch, and I said, Can you catch? Where's the ca where's the ball? It was lobbing to mid on. For a catch. And uh, so that was out. I got naught there. Second innings, I got run out for naught. So it was three, uh, three noughts in a row. And it was, uh, it was a nightmare, absolute nightmare start to uh, to my test career. But it was it was a lesson learned. Did you start sort of question your own ability? Or did you, were you fairly confident of, you know, being able to sort of cut it at this level? I think I was too young to start questioning my ability then because I was only 21. So I think at that age, you don't really question your ability uh, a lot because you know, you're, you know, you're on that sort of curve, no matter what happens, you're still on that curve where you're, you're, you're always going to get better and better. You don't sort of question yourself. I think you question your, yourself probably more later in your career where you think, okay, how much better can I get? And you know, how, how, how you know, can I keep dominating my, my game and, and all that sort of stuff. And um, it, I didn't really question it back then. I just I just took it on the chin. I, I realised that, look, I've had a bad tour and I probably won't play the next one. I might get a chance, who knows? But, you know, if I, if I get dropped, I get dropped, that's fine. I'll come back. 
but you made up for it with the uh, subsequent tour uh, with the West Indies. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that was a good one. I mean, uh, getting a hundred in Barbados was big because I was just coming off the back of a um, hundred playing for the A A team. We were out there as well. We're touring alongside the main team, and I just got a hundred in the in the game for the A team, and somebody had to go home or someone got injured or whatever it was. And then I came in, uh, scored my hundred there and it was good. Then we went back to England and played West Indies again and, and got a couple of hundreds there as well. So it was, that was always a good feeling. Getting a hundred at Lords was, was special. Those three consecutive hundreds, obviously, you know, nobody will ever take those away from you, but obviously, you know, you do hear people sort of commenting about that, you know, they were cheap hundreds against an ordinary West Indian attack. What you also to take on that, Ravi? Yeah, I know, but you have to look at. Um, I think in that in that Lord's Test, I think um, well, we were in a bit of trouble, and um, the ball was nipping about. I don't think anyone else got close to scoring a hundred in that test um, for both teams. So um, it was a it was a decent attack, I thought at the time. Uh, but people can say what they want, man. That you know, what I mean, it's, it's easy to say what they want. I don't really care. I don't care what people say. I honestly don't. Obviously, both of you have had very, very sort of similar careers in the sense that, you know, you've been in and out of the England setup. Obviously, Ravi, you played a lot more ODIs than, than Summit. But uh, you must have quite sort of a strong self-belief and inner strength that keeps you both going, Summit. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, as, as mentioned before, that self-belief is a big thing for me. Um and that's kind of drives me to play and perform the way I do, to be honest. Um, and always proving a point to everybody that, that always watches. Um, and always making sure that I will get the man of the match when it counts. Um, and that, that I pride myself on that in, in big games, um, wherever it is, um, I want that man of the match. And I think that that's what drives me to play cricket um, and try and succeed and, and earn, a, earn a living that, can, that I can keep going on for, for as long as I can. I mean, obviously, you sort of uh, showed your true worth, uh, Summit, in 2017, which was a stellar year for you. Summit, are you there? I didn't quite, yeah, yeah, I well, didn't quite get the end of in, that. In, in 2017, you showed your true worth and what you, you know, what you are capable of, despite any criticisms, because you really, really sort of stepped up to the plate and it was a great year for you. Uh, yeah, it was. Um, it was. It was a year where... 16 didn't go that well and I, I, to, to still when people try and write you off um, and say you're not quite as good as uh, you think you are and and that kind of words kind of stick in your brain for a bit. And, uh, as I said proving a point is, is why I play cricket um, and obviously I love cricket but but that's not the reason why people want to criticise I think that they criticise because they think you're not good enough and I think that if they actually played it um, at, a, at the highest standard then they'll actually realise that it's not as easy as people want what they make out. Um, and I think the, the careers that me and Ravi have had, the, the amount of games that we hold, um, it's it's quite one one big feat that we, we've got. Um, and I think that obviously we have the experience that comes along with it. We've played X amount of games in, in all formats of the game. Um, and yeah, the, the critics will always be there. And again, I kind of have to agree with Ravi that I, I don't really care what they say. Um, it's kind of, I, I'll prove you wrong. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Guys, I've got loads of questions here. I'm just going to go to them for the next few minutes or so. I'll try and get through as many as we can. I'll put them up on the screen. I'll read them out as well. Okay, just bear with me. Okay. Uh, I'll go to Ravi on this one. As a young cricketer, how do you deal with nerves? And obviously, you'll have been through that process yourselves. Is there any particular approach that you take, uh, Ravi? Um, well, as a young cricketer, I think your your primary goal should be to go out and show what you can do. Really, it's it's a, it's a great stage to show off, um, and I think that's that's important to think as a cricketer, especially as a young cricketer, is to go go out and show off. It's not about you know how much how many runs can you score on the day and how many wickets can you take. Go go and show off. Go and show your skills. If you're if you're a fast bowler, go and bowl fast. If you're a you're a batsman and you're a big hitter, go and play your big shots. And if you're not a big hitter, if you're more of a little, you know, sort of a stroke player, then play your strokes, enjoy yourself and, and use it as a stage to show off. Um, and I think that would sort of change your your mindset and your and your and the way you deal with nerves. 
We've got another question, but it's not a question. It's actually it's uh, singing uh, your praises here, Ravi. Uh, it's a long one, so I don't think it'll fit across the screen. Uh, it's from Sajid Patel, and he says, you've achieved many accolades from this beautiful game. You play for England, Essex, many international T20 games, and you've kept a tie and an eye on community as well. Along with the way, Shah, you've attended the National Cricket League annual dinners, support in the community uh, through Jitesh Shahbai from JK Shah Accountants. So someone there, obviously, who's very, very complimentary, Ravi, of the things that you do outside of cricket as well. To what extent does that play a large part in your sort of day-to-day -day existence? Um, look, I, I like giving back to young cricketers, especially where I'm from. Uh, there's a lot of young Asian cricketers who, you know, are trying to make it. Um, they're trying to get into break into county cricket and, and all that sort of because they love the game and that's a, that's a that's a big game around East London where I come from and so it's important to give back uh, to those because they're, they're the sort of guys who supported you I came through that system so I know what it's like so to have someone there to to give back uh, just to see a face sometimes and and you know for me the big the big face that I saw was Hachin Tendulkar that changed the way my outlook on cricket um, from a young age I think I met him first when I was 16 or something or 17 and it, it completely changed the way I thought about cricket. It gave me so much belief. Uh, and if I can do that for a youngster, because I've been there, I, I, you know, I've, I've been through it. So I know I've only got to change one, one person um, who that guy might go on and play for Essex or go on and play for England and, and, you know, dominate the world stage. It's only got to be one person. Uh, and I felt like I've, I feel like I've done my job. Well, keep up the good work. So obviously, you're doing a lot of fantastic, positive community engagement there. Uh, Summit, next question. If you could speak to a 14-year-old Summit Patel, what advice would you have for him? Um, I would say go and enjoy it. Um, don't put too much pressure on yourself. Um, if you're good, you'll always be good. Um, again, yeah, as I said, there's, there's no pressure to perform at 14 years old. So... I know it's easier saying it now, but 14 years old, you don't know hardly anything about cricket um, as much as you would like to think you do, but you don't. Um, just go and enjoy it and play some shots and, and bowl as fast as you can and, and spin the ball hard and smack it. Ravi, franchise cricket, especially subject of yours, you could be a mastermind for that. But, uh, how important is it for young rookie players based in England? Franchise cricket, I think, Look, first of all, franchise cricket for for a young player in England is is a difficult thing to break into. I think I don't think we should all get it twisted and think, yeah, young players are just going to go around, play around the world, and and play all these sort of leagues. It, it doesn't work like that. You've got to earn your way into those leagues. Um, young cricketers just they don't break through because I think you've a lot. There are exceptions that will get through and you know have a really good tournament somewhere and then go on and break into another tournament, but I find the players that go on and play long term in the leagues are the ones who have played international cricket and got some calibre because it just takes one bad tournament for an unrecognised rookie, uh, one bad tournament and people will write him off. Um, whereas a seasoned cricketer, people would just say, oh, OK, well, it's one of those things. He has, he's had a bad tournament and he'll come back good the next tournament. Generally, that's what happens. Um, so I think, I think to break into franchise cricket is going to, you know, You've got to go through the system anyway. Uh, you can't just you can't pick and choose where you're going to go. You can't just pick up, pack your bag, and say, "Oh yeah, I'm going to go and play in the IPO. Oh, I'm going to go and play in the PSL." They've got to pick you first. They've got to see that you're good enough to get in. Summit, anything you want to add to that? No, absolutely. I think the the things that we learned. I think growing up, what we learned that there was no franchise cricket. So all we knew was was first class cricket and playing your county. Um, and obviously doing going to the mill of, of playing current cricket day in, day out, learning your trade. Um, we're kind of getting the rewards now playing franchise cricket later on in your life um, rather than earlier. I think there's only a certain few youngsters that will get the chance to go and play franchise cricket straight away. Um, they'll definitely find it hard because playing for your county, you've always done that, but playing for someone you don't know and an owner that you don't know and a management team that you don't know can be a little bit different, difficult. So yeah, I think and and the yeah. pressures and the pressures of playing being an overseas cricketer as well. You're an overseas yeah, at the end of the day. You're you're one of the people that they're looking at to win in the game of cricket. So that's a different type of a different type of responsibility as well. 
Yeah, and I think if you've not done that in first class cricket and you've not won games for your county, I don't think that you'll do that straight away for a franchise. I think you'll find that difficult. Uh, we'll go on to a question from uh, Arshad Hussain. Uh, Adam Hussain, I beg your pardon. He's a, a youngster. He's played county under 10s, under 11s as a batsman. But this year, he said it's a big year for him. He's going to be playing senior cricket for his club. So he's making the step up from junior cricket to senior cricket as a 12 stroke 13 year old. What would you advise him that would help him to make that step up from juniors to seniors? Um, at that age, it's it's the same thing for every youngster. Just go and enjoy the, the experience. I mean, I think I started playing senior cricket around the same age and I think I made my first team debut at 14. Um, and do you know what? When you're that young, you're quite oblivious to everything. I don't know what you feel, Sammy. You just, you don't understand what's going on. You just go out and it's a bat and a ball and it's just a game of cricket and that's that's the way it should remain. I don't think you should think about it too much. Sam, what do you no, think? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, yeah, enjoy the game of cricket. Um, you'll naturally get better by playing with adults anyway. I don't think you need to be looking to get better. Um, the step up is is the step up and you'll learn you'll learn gradually and, and you'll learn things in your game that, that just naturally come along and then suddenly you'll get better at it. Another one on the Summit's uh, pet subject. Sorry, wrong question. We'll go to that one. There's one somewhere about staying fit. You've stayed at the pinnacle of T20 and first class cricket for nigh on 20 years now. So how do you keep yourself motivated and staying physically fit? Because obviously, you know, it's a ruthless business now as this franchise cricket and even county cricket. Yeah, I just think that, again, I, I love the game and I know a fit for purpose is, is what I think is that I know exactly what to do to keep myself fit. Um, and can I deliver my skill? And I think that skill, cricket is a skill game and you've got to be on top of that. I think that if you let anything else, you can't afford behind, but, but sk your skill has to be at the top um, to survive in, in professional cricket. Yeah. And I agree with you there, Sam, as well. I think, I think that whole fitness thing and, You've got to be fit to do the purpose or the 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 work that you're going to do. And, you know, if you're a fast bowler, you've got to be fit to bowl fast. Um, you ain't got to be you ain't got to be fit to lift, you know, 100 kgs or anything. You've got to be fit for your purpose uh, and you've got to train that way. Um, I think the older you get, you've got to you got to maintain your your training yeah. because I find in your in your sort of 30s, mid 30s is, you know, you, you can deteriorate a lot quicker. Um, yeah. your fitness can deteriorate quicker now um, so now I'm going to the gym a lot more than I ever would have I'm running a bit more just to keep those muscles uh, you got to keep them awake you got to keep them yeah. you know 35 is not old but I'm talking in the in a professional game where you know you're playing at serious intensity those you know you got to keep your muscles going and working and, and you know all that sort of stuff it, it comes into it so you got to work it out. And those who don't work it out go out the game early. And those who work it out, you know, they hang around and, and play for long for long periods. you got to try and keep up with the youngsters. These youngsters are quick these days. Um, and I think speed is is one thing that I gradually get into terms with. And obviously staying in the gym um, and pumping some weights because these guys now smack out of the park. You look at the guys, Puran, Russell. Um, these guys are strong, naturally. Um, and I think that T20 is now becoming a bit of a, a powerful game and you need you do need ball strikers and especially if you do bat lower down the order you're, you're going to be asked to hit hit some balls at the park um, so you've got to stay strong Imran wants to know uh, what's been your favourite T20 league to play in and why Ravi um, look I've enjoyed a couple of T20 leagues so I think um, the IPO and the PSO have been two brilliant leagues to play in um, I think they set up there as 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 probably the two top leagues to play in, uh, in terms of you know the way the way the the leagues are run and um, just the standard of them as well. I think it's been they've both been brilliant. Obviously, IPL is on a different level at the moment because I think the pressure in in IPL cricket is is they're probably above international cricket at the moment. Um, the way you know the the sort of focus on on that league and then standard of the PSL is, is awesome as well. They've been two very enjoyable leagues, I think, to play in um, uh, over the years. Samit, would you agree with that or would you have a different... Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> no, no, absolutely. I think that I've not I've not been unfortunate and, and not lucky enough to play in the IPL. Ravi's obviously played in the IPL and, and done really well. Um, and I think that what the PSL for me is a big one because the standard of bowling in the PSL is really, really good. And I think you look at the attacks, um, there's some serious pace. And I know Pakistan are renowned for having pace. Um, there's there's two or three bowlers in every team that, that can clock 90 um, or close to. And I think that, obviously, I think the IPL, the standard of batting is very good. And the standard of bowling in the PSL is is phenomenal. And those two leagues together... Um, are up there, but I have been lucky enough to play in the Big Bash show as Rav. Um, and again, I enjoyed the Big Bash just because I was there for a short amount of time uh, with the Renegades. Um, it can become a bit of a long tournament. Um, two and a half months is pretty long. Um, with the PSL, it's pretty short. So, yeah, um, that's two leagues that I, I enjoyed. Uh, both being of uh, Asian heritage, do you think it is harder for Asian cricketers to become pros like yourselves? Ravi? Tough question because it's on you at the end of the day. And I've always been a firm believer in if you're good enough, you'll make it. Um, it's, it's, it's been one thing I've always stood by from a young age. I've always said to myself, look, if you're good enough, you'll do it. And it, whatever it was, whether it was cricket or other th aspects in life, uh, whether I want to step up and play for England or want to, uh, or just got dropped and I want to get back, I always said to myself, listen, if you're good enough, you'll do it. Um, and I still firmly believe in that. Sam, you you firmly believe in that? Yeah, you're good. You're good. Um, I won't go. I won't go away from that. If you're good, you get picked. If you're not, you won't. Is there anybody on the radar from the BIM communities that you guys have sort of cast an eye over, and you think you know this boy or girl has got serious potential and they could go all the way? Is there anyone in the county circuit that springs to mind? Uh, there's not a lot. There's not a lot coming through at the moment. No. I mean, I, I, there, there's a, obviously I played. I played for a county Essex where we had a lot of Asian cricketers sort of come, you know, on the fringes and and stuff. So I mean, I think Essex are uh, are one of the counties that that produce actually probably produce most most Asian cricketers. Um, they do seem to come through the academies, uh, so they're up there. And Sussex now they they are up there as well in terms of what they produced with Bame as well. So you know that there, there are some good ones. There are some good ones out there. I wouldn't. I think it's a little bit too early to say. Um, I think, um, and also miss. I think missing out all that cricket this year with Corona, we didn't really get a chance to see any newcomers and and who's really out there. So you know, we kind of kind of out of touch with it a little bit. Anything on that? Uh, Sorry, you want to add anything? No, not really. We, we actually didn't see much cricket this summer, so it, it was pretty difficult. Um, but there is obviously talent out there. All the Asian kids, you look at the county circuit, um, look at the county systems, all the age groups, they're full of Asians. But the ones that actually go through and make it properly, and I'm not just saying to play one or two games for a second 11 or a first 11, I'm saying to make it properly. Um, I'm going back to the, the last question is that you're going to have to be good. Um, and if people are learning that there is going to be some hard work had to be done um, if, you, if you want to stay and, and make a profession out of it. Obviously, both of you guys are still active in the game. But when you do eventually hang up your boots, what sort of uh, career ambitions do you have? Other alternatives sort of... Are you looking to go into media, coaching, or you've got business interests? Uh, just quick one, Ravi. On that, did you, uh, if memory says me right, did you delve in the uh, fried chicken um, business many <laughs> minutes ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I set up a a chicken uh, shop for mate. That was for my family, really. I think we all at that time when um, uh, it was a tough time. I think with going for my parents at that time and my brother. Nobody was in a job, so you know I, it was obviously my responsibility, um, given the fortunate position I was in, to to do something about it. And we, my idea was to set up a uh, set up shop and let those let those guys run it, and and it's been a success uh, on that part. So that that's been good. But I think in terms of moving forward, um, I don't think both of us, me and Sammy, I think would probably both stay in the game. I think we both love the game. Uh, in some way, I don't think we can leave the game. So I think that the natural step would be probably to go into coaching. I, I definitely would love to go into coaching and media, both of them. 
I, I look, uh, I would definitely, I would love it. Sam, would you reckon? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, stay in, uh, I'll stay in the game, but I reckon I try and enhance my property portfolio um, as I'm still playing cricket um, to make life a little bit easier when I do hang up the boots. Um, but again, yeah, loving the game, you can't go away from that. And the game's given me a lot. Um, I'd love to pass back um, my knowledge um, of, of all the cricket I've played, um, especially to youngsters um, who are definitely going to need it um, going forward, especially playing franchise cricket around the world um, and, and obviously representing internationally. Um, so, yeah, I'd love to stand again. Sammy, is that one of the reasons why you've signed up to play club cricket uh, for the season ahead? Obviously, you want to give something back. Well, as I'm not now not playing red ball cricket, um, absolutely give a little bit back to uh, to the to, to club cricket as um, and obviously enjoy it. My brother will be playing. Um, that's one of the reasons why I've signed to play um, and have a bit of fun. Really, um, there's nothing more to it. And as again, I love playing cricket. As I've said, um, so yeah. Talking of fun, what do you guys uh, do, Ravi, when you're away from the game? How do you switch off? What what do you go to just to have a bit of downtime? Well, before it used to be quite tough. I mean, I've always been that guy where in my downtime, I used to go and practice. Um, you know, there was no such thing as downtime, really. It was go from the game, finish the game, and then think, okay, well, I need to improve here now. I'll go and do that. That would be, I would literally live and sleep and eat whatever, cricket, 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 cricket to get better. Uh, but now, I, you know, I found other things in life which I enjoy. But I really actually... I took up golf not long ago. I really, I really enjoy playing golf. Um, it's a, it's, it's a competitive game, and and um, when you're away from cricket, it's the next best thing. I think personally, I think it's brilliant. I've got hooked on it now. Sammy, when you're not touring properties for your portfolio, what do you tend to uh, spend your time in doing? Uh, Netflix and documentaries, a bit of Animal Planet actually. I think me and Ravi, um, we always definitely on tour. <laughs> we always. We put on uh, the, a few tiger and lion documentaries to get past listen, listen. Hours. the the TV the TV channels yeah the TV channels in subcontinent are so bad right so we just so go, we, like, we just put Animal Planet on because it's the only channels that we enjoy watching. Um, so. We order two we order two chais and then make sure they come and then we stick Animal Planet on. A couple of samosa as well and and jobs done but. There you um, go. But I'm not a massive TV guy. Um, you know, it's not something I enjoy doing. I can't sit there for like hours watching TV. It really bugs me. I feel like I need to do something. Uh, I feel useless if I'm not, you know, if I'm not up in the morning trying to do something and get out there, learn something new or, you know, get on the golf course. I don't know. I just struggle to sit in front of the TV. It's just, you know, it's that's well, just me though. Yeah, the last three days we've been like a living healthy in that case, cooped up in that yeah, hotel. Absolutely. absolutely. Oh, absolutely. man. Was Struggling. So hopefully, you know, you'll have some better news first thing in the morning. You can get out there and sort of uh, get rid of some of that pent-up energy, get in the gym, get in the pool, get on the golf course and hit a few balls with, with the boys. It's got another question from uh, Mo Hussein. I mean, you may not know the answer to this or even have an answer to this, but why are some counties better than others attracting young Asian cricketers? Obviously, you mentioned Essex uh, as being a prime example and historically, obviously, clubs like Yorkshire and even Lancashire then even Nottinghamshire. Uh, why is it that... Is it, is it anything to do with the demographics of that area or, or is it maybe the coaching system that are in place? I um, think demographics plays a big part. Yeah, definitely. Demographics is a big part because look at look look at Essex. There's, there's you know, massive, massive Asian community in the east of London or in London in general when Essex is very close to, close to London. East of London is very close to Chelmsford. So... The natural progression is from there to go on and, and, and move into the ranks of Essex. And then you've got Yorkshire, which has a massive community of Asians and Nottingham. All these places have it. But then if you go down to, let's say, Somerset, you th there's not a big Asian community there. There's hardly anyone there uh, of, of, uh, of the Asian origin. So the chances of seeing Asian cricketers come through their setup is, is obviously extremely low. Why would you go to Somerset? <laughs> yeah, why would you live in Somerset anyway? Why would you do that? Must be for the side, the cider. That's all I can assume. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, maybe for the cider. But I think that I'm surprised that Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire, Leicester don't produce more Asian cricketers. I'm it baffles me. Um, 
there's so much community wise and demographics wise that there's so many out there that they all get mi missed and and i'm i find it very hard to believe um you can put it down to a lot of things but some onus has to be on like the individual um but as i said before if you're good you're good and the fact that they keep getting missed i find it hard to believe but there, there, there's a couple of really there's a couple of really good guys at essex you know just for the last few years when i was there i mean they they you know bringing in the east of london into the essex cricket the connection they've been bringing in has been brilliant there's a guy called arfan there's a, there's a guy there called dan uh, dan feast and they've been brilliant they they've really you know sort of mixed east london into the essex cricket and that i think that's going to be a massive one in the future i think you're going to see a lot of asian cricketers come through uh, in the essex ranks we've got well, a we we we've, we've sorry, got sorry. We, we've got a bloke at knots and and ravi knows him as well it's bill al shafia who who does some work with the age group stuff and and I know he's trying to bring in some of the uh some of the talented Asian boys that need obviously some discipline and some work um but I'm he's saying that they're all talented and, and Asians are talented um it's how we use it to be honest and and how we get treated uh final question because I'm going to let you guys go. You've been on for over an hour and a quarter. It's absolutely fantastic that you've joined us. Uh, as you mentioned some shirts uh, uh Ravia <laughs> Yeah, one from Arman is asking for a shirt. Now you may recall when you were out in uh, Pakistan with the MCC, uh, uh, a rather uh, shall we say rotund gentleman by the name of Nasser who was with you along with Gofraz. You may have had conversations. Yeah. You, you did yeah. have conversations with Big Nas, a uh, lovely jovial chap, yeah. and uh, <laughs> he's a great man. Yeah, top bloke, really, really salty. Uh, true Yorkshireman, and um, this is his son actually, Arman. He's asking if you've got any shirts knocking around, Ravi. Uh, just send them his way. So uh, I've put that out there for you. Maybe next time when uh, you're abroad, if you can find a shirt and bring it back with you and then just yeah. get in touch, we'll uh, pass it on to the young man. No problem. No problem. Fantastic. Guys, it's been an absolute pleasure having both of you on. And I really, really do appreciate you giving up your time. I know you, obviously you're over there in Abu Dhabi at the moment. So thank you very, very much from myself and everyone who's tuned in for today's uh, broadcast. It's been very informative. It's been interesting. It's been entertaining and enlightening. So I want to wish you both the very, very best for the uh, T10 and for all your assignments going forward. And we'll be watching very, very closely, see how you fare. And hopefully maybe, you know, in a while, we might get you back on again and see how you've done. So please do join us again. Thank you very much indeed to both of you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Cheers, bye. Guys, thank you. Gonna, uh, okay.